This video is brought to you by Wicket Cricket Manager. Name and job title, please. Raf Nicholson, Senior Lecturer in Sports Journalism at Bournemouth University and Freelance Cricket Journalist. Okay, how many boards in the moment have equal match fees for women and men as, as we sit here and talk, Raf? I think it's four. Um, so in the last year or so, it was New Zealand first, then India, then most recently South Africa and a few days ago, England. So it's a trend and it may, probably is the sort of thing that looks very good on a uh, press release, uh, plays very good on social media, annoys the right kind of people on social media as well. Um, how many people, though, do you think who see this sort of casually flick up in their feed realise that that doesn't mean that the women get paid the same as the men? And actually, I, I, you might know this more than I do, but, you know, in men's cricket, the actual match fees probably make up less than 15 to 20 percent of what a man actually makes playing for his nation in most countries. Yeah, it's a tiny proportion of the overall earnings. Um, I would say a lot of people don't realise, and I think that there are lots of people in the media who don't seem to realise either, and um, actually kind of muddy the waters a bit. So I pulled out some of the coverage um, of the ECB's decision to um, introduce equal match fees for the women. Um, there was a tweet by BBC TMS which said, men and women will now earn the same when they play cricket for England. Uh-uh. <laughs> um, there was a, a Crick Info um, headline that said England women get match fees hike to be equal with England men. No. <laughs> um, and then there was some other various headlines saying England men and women cricketers to receive equal pay. So the, the, the press cover it in a way that gives the impression that it's equal pay when it isn't. Yeah. It, I, and I do think that it's a tough for a headline writer. It's probably a tough not for the tweet. For the tweet, you should be able, you should have enough room. For a headline writer, it maybe is a little bit tough to fit it in exactly the way that you want it to be. But the truth is that, you know, traditionally in cricket, your match fee was your, you know, 80 to 90% of what you made. And then as Cricket Australia come in with contracts and they understand that these players need to be, you know, you can't just pay people to play games because obviously injuries become a thing and you want your players to be available and you know, all that sort of stuff. So as that comes in in the 90s, where cricket sort of follows, you know, rugby league and Aussie rules in Australia, we start to get contracts. That feeds into, I think, all of the world now. You have your centralized pool of players. You know, you have 20, 25, 30, 35 players, depending on the country, depending on the situation. They are then paid a salary regardless of if they play any games. All right? And then when they play those games, they then get an individual match fee. So the players who are actually out there doing the, the job you know, get that. And, you know, I, I think it was, a, it used to be a thousand dollars per game for a West Indian player to play a test match. Um, I would hope that's gone up slightly, but that, I think that was when I talked to Chris Gale in 2012. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think it was a thousand, I have to go back, but it's, there's a lot of countries that don't pay a lot for match fees. So it's, that's not where, as a cricketer, you're making the bulk of your money. The bulk of your money is in the actual contract itself. And that just seemed to be either ignored or... And, and I'll put it to you this way. This is a feel-good story. And you might feel like... And you and I don't feel like these sorts of people. But other people might feel like a bit of a dick for going, well, England are actually trying to do something right here. And then for the rest of us, you know, people like you and me to go, yeah, but that's not where you make the majority of your money. So that's kind of a pointless thing. I, do, I think there would be some people out there, especially that don't know about this, who would feel more comfortable just going with the headline and going with the good news rather than going, uh, sorry, uh, sorry to shit in your cereal, everyone, uh, but we need to actually discuss this a little bit more. Yeah, but I do think um, the cynic in me actually thinks that the cricket boards encourage this perception and because they know it's a feel-good story and it's an easy win for them to look like they're doing something good on the cheap, basically. I mean, look at the situation that the ECB are currently facing. They've got this um, report by the Independent Commission for Equity um, that says, you know, you, we, you know, the, the current situation is not fair um, you know, sexism is, and racism is rife across your sport and you need to introduce equal pay um, and that means equal salaries in international cricket by 2030. And what are you going to do? And the ECB look at this list of recommendations and they go, right, well, 
that one's easy. We'll issue an apology. What else can we do that's easy? Oh, they've said that we need to equalise match fees, so we'll do that as well. But the really difficult call and the really um, the really difficult one financially is the actual overall equal salaries. So I suppose what, what my my cynicism about this is partly because I think that the cricket boards, the ECB and others do this as a way of generating good publicity when it's easy for them to do. No, no, I agree. I, I, I think that's 100% what they did. And they realised that the vast majority of people who would be repeating this wouldn't understand what you and I know um, and wouldn't look into it that much either, right? It, you know, it's a headline. You put it up in, you, on your site if you're a cricket aggregator and, and, and you let it go. And we, we saw New Zealand do that. It's why I didn't cover it when New Zealand did it. I, I got a lot of questions at the time. People were very excited. And I was like, because if I do, I mean, I have to go into the fact that it's not as good as you think it is. Yeah. Um, and it's not what people believe it to be. And, and it's worth stating that in the 2012 World Cup, and I believe this was the last World Cup that I'm aware of that this was the case. But in the 2012 World Cup, uh, the T20 World Cup, or what was it? The World T20, as it was called at that stage. That was a dual men's and women's tournament. And the women got a lower per diem um, than the men. Because we all know that women don't eat as much as men. They don't want to do their laundry as much as men. They, uh, don't need, uh, they don't need taxi rides as much as men. All those sorts of normal things. And that was, that was in 2012 to show you how bad things were. But giving women the same amount of per diem, again, doesn't make a big difference. And of course, that was seen as a win at the time. But there are so many obvious little things that could be fixed. The match, match fees is obviously one. But you did an article um, in The Guardian. You actually wrote it today, but who knows how long it will take me to get this episode up for people to actually see this. But um, you wrote an article in, in The Guardian today that said that the, um, the umpires for the women's 100 get paid. Is it a, th- a third of what the men get paid or roughly around a third to yeah. a, you know, of what the men get paid? I mean, you shouldn't need a th- hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on a report to work out that there's an er- error there. They're making decisions in that game. And, you know, that must, this, this whole story must really hurt those people who say things like, oh, well, you know, women's game doesn't make any money and, and you know, and, and the men's game makes more money. So, m- you know, men's players should get paid more money. The umpires... The umpires? How is that not a universal fee? If you're if you're doing a top level game, you know, pay the test umpires more, pay the first class umpires less. You know, it should be on a sliding scale yeah. till you get down to development level cricket. I've got no problem with that. But how is how is umpiring in the women's game different to umpiring in the men's from a financial point of view? That doesn't make any sense. And also, if you're trying to get women into the game, is that not a cheap way of doing it? Like, for me, that would be like, what are you, no, what are you talking about? We've got, you know, all these women um, umpires over here, and they get paid the same as the men. Um, it, it's such a baffling decision. And, and it isn't really a decision, is it? It's that years ago, someone just decided it didn't matter as a game, so they weren't going to pay as much for it, and no one ever looked at it again. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and basically what's happened is that the women's game in England is becoming more professional, but the umpiring structure has not caught up with that. So all of the full-time paid employee umpires of the ECB are largely umpiring in men's cricket. And so then um, a lot of the umpiring in women's cricket is by people who are kind of on part-time retainers. Um, and they haven't, they haven't quite, the ECB haven't quite caught up with these changes um, that and you know the the suggestion the suggestion as you say that umpiring particularly in the hundred competition whereby um, you know they bang on about it being all about gender equality and actually that's a really poor signal of how the measure by which you regard the women's games it really suggests that I mean they're doing the same job they're all on TV they all have DRS it's exactly the same um, and yet. The women, the, the umpires in the women's competition are paid less. And I th- was it in your article you talked about was one of the one of the jobs was eighty pounds a day for umpiring? Yeah, so that's and in, someone I saw in the comments. Yeah, what what was that one? So what that, competition was that that is the ma- that's the fee you get if you umpire in a um, a fifty over Rachel Hayhoe Flint match, which is the women's professional fifty over domestic competition. So. That's got to be very close to minimum wage, um, as someone else was pointing out. And yeah. then, of course, you have to probably travel that game. You're probably not going to be a local, uh, you know, umpiring in that way. I mean, it, it, it's it's such a it's such a weird way of looking at it. And, and to go back to the hundred, 
You know, the 100 was marketed as this equal tournament, and yet the, you know, the bottom pay for the women in the 100 compared to the bottom play for a man playing in the 100 is, you know, you're not... If, you, if you're a woman in the 100 and you're the 14th best player in the squad, uh, you are not a professional cricketer. You are a cricketer getting a couple of weeks uh, work. You know, you make as much for going on, going on a cruise and serving drinks, right? Like, it's not... I'm not, I'm, I'm, maybe you get more. I don't. I don't know how much you get paid for going on those cruises. You couldn't pay me enough um, <laughs> to get, to do that job. Um, but 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 yeah. So you know, it, there's so many obvious ways that the hundred made made a mistake. But because it's umpiring, and also because, let's be honest, and I say this all the time, p- people still complain about the you know the top level men's umpiring. And I was like, you need to go and watch a first class game. And the other thing I say is you need to go and watch a women's game. If you want to see crap umpiring, it's not happening on the international panel. There are some umpires who are better on the top of the international panel, and it's a tough gig, and we go over every individual decision. I mean, there was a, there was a run out in the Women's World Cup in 2017 that was, uh, the mistake was made, and it was about a 40-centimeter mistake, right? Like, and they didn't have DRS, of course, because uh, they didn't need it for that particular tournament for some reason. And... Like you just, that's just a mistake that just probably wouldn't happen at the top level of cricket. Even now they don't give the, um, the, the decisions anymore. Some of the umpiring that you see at women's cricket, and it's not just women's cricket because it is first class cricket. It's some of the lower T20 leagues. And, uh, you know, I've seen some very good A-level a, a umpires at times where I was like, oh my God, uh, does this person actually know the full laws that they are <laughs> supposedly proceeding over here? But there's no doubt that there is women's cricket, um, uh, women's cricket umpiring is something that is a long way behind where it should be. I think that's right, but um, I don't know if you've come across Anna Harris, who's one of the kind of up-and-coming young umpires in women's cricket in England. Um, Apparently, either last season or the season before, one of her first seasons umpiring in professional women's cricket, um, they do analysis of the umpires' performances across the whole season, and she was top of of all umpiring in England. And she... But she's on one of these part-time retainer contracts um and so it's oh, I, it's I'm nothing not saying, to do it's not nothing saying. to do with the and it's also nothing to do with the gender of the umpire but it's no. just that there are less opportunities for women umpires and the other frustrating thing but about I'm not all saying this that is women that, umpires yeah. are, are bad i'm saying that the umpiring quality in women's cricket yeah. whether it be men or women's and of course it's bad because if you're if you're a good young especially if you're a good young male umpire let's forget the women umpires for a moment which, which is a whole separate issue. if you're a good young male umpire why on earth would you not be trying to get to the men's game where you could actually do this profession? Yeah, well, that's what I was just going to say. And that's because the, sit- the setup that we've got at the moment is somebody like Sue Redfern um, can only become yeah. a professional umpire if she says, OK, I'm going to umpire in lots of men's cricket. You can't be a professional umpire in women's cricket at the moment. Um, a bit like you can't really be a full-time professional journalist in women's cricket at the moment because it doesn't pay well enough. But anyway, that's that's, that's an aside. Um, the the money is also all true. the money is all in the men's stream, and that's the structural inequality mm. of English cricket. And I'm assuming it's equally the case in other countries around the world. So that's the frustrating thing. And the ECB say we want more women umpires oh, and also we're going to filter them into umpiring women's cricket because role models, all of that. Now, I get that. OK, but what you're effectively saying then is that all of the women umpires are going to then, for, the, for all of their umpiring careers, be subject to worse pay and worse conditions. Yeah. Well, and, and also, do you remember the, the, the last World Cup they decided to have um, all women panels and and again it goes back to the equal pay um, PR of, oh that's great press but my first thing was have we been training these women correctly on DRS are these women already are they experienced umpires or are you going to have a worse quality of umpire because you haven't been pushing any umpires and then suddenly as a show that you're on side um, you're going to uh, promote them all you, you're putting them in a position to fail and yeah. if you're a part-time umpire that means you actually have to do other things. Whereas Sue Redfern is in a position as a professional now where she can actually travel the world. And even when she is not contracted for uh, English cricket, before she gets to the ICC panel, and the ICC panel is like, you know, that, that's when you've made it, right? That's, yeah. that's a whole different level. But there's a level between that, right, where you can travel around the world, you can do franchise cricket, uh, you can go and do, you know, major games overseas, and you, it means that you're a professional umpire. And... Chances are, even if you're not a particularly good umpire, no, 
Rob Tucker, you might still <laughs> get better at, at the skills that you need to be yeah. over a period of time, right? They, they, they're not in a position to be able to do that if you're a part-time umpire and you're not at that level where you're being recognized. So the, the whole system doesn't really make any sense. Let's forget about the umpires for a moment because no one wants to talk about them. <laughs> um, uh, let's, let's go back to the professional women's cricket. Yeah. So I, I, I would assume, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would assume that the first ever professional women's cricket league is what we call the Reds versus Blues. I think you've even been on this podcast before, talking about it before but essentially some random french american entrepreneur realized that if he put a bunch of women on a cricket ground uh, uh, together at the same time he could bring people into the, the games the sad thing is he was a hundred percent right but he didn't really go out and get the best cricketers um it wasn't it wasn't like me um, uh, what's um what's the movie in in america with the baseball movie with gina davis and everything is it, it wasn't like field a, of dreams is that it no that's the that's the men's one there's a woman's one uh, everyone everyone uh, everyone who likes sports movies will know the name of this movie except for you and i at the moment <laughs> but it wasn't like that where they went out looking for the best women's baseballers to play in, in a major league yeah. they literally went out and what they did was is they they looked for pretty young women they then gave them false names if i remember correctly paid them um, except for the fact that eventually he ran off and didn't pay them for the second part of it, but started to pay them. They played as professionals. People came. From that, that was 1895, 1890? 1890. Yeah. So from 1890 until England uh, making their women professional in, uh, what was that, 2012, 2014? 2014. Yeah. Between that, Raf, could you tell me a brief history of professionalism in women's cricket and uh, if, there, if there was any? Oh, goodness. Um, I'm just trying to think. I don't, I don't think there was. Um, and, and I know that there's going to be people screaming at that um, now going, oh, yes, there was. Um, yeah. There, I reckon there would have been games where there was match receipts. Right, I think that would have happened on occasion, don't you think? Like, um, oh, okay. I, I know so, there's that famous. Wi- yeah, I have thought yeah, of yeah. like occasionally. <laughs> yeah, but I can't. Im- there certainly wouldn't have been anything beyond that. But I'm sure there would have been occasions where women got together at, and played a game. You know, there's that famous women's team from rural Australia that was famous in in, in Warrnambool that t- people would go. They probably got some of the match re- receipts, although it might have gone back into the club. I, I don't know. So there were stuff like that. So you must have one one or two of those. In England, the Women's Cricket Association, who formed in 1926, specifically banned professionalism, and they were really obsessed with amateurism. Um, but there were kind of women's cricket leagues in the north of England in the 1930s that were separate to the Women's Cricket Association um, and were generally kind of set up and run by men who thought, oh, there's you know a quick buck to be made here. Um, and they, some of the women within those games were um, were given um, kind of payments. There would there would be a collection if somebody scored a hundred or took a few wickets. Um, there might be a collection at the ground, and then they would get some money from that. Um, and you know, I guess similar to to men's league cricket, sometimes they would be given kind of time off work to go off and play, and that would still be paid. So they were sort of a little bit professional, um, but not in the kind of structured way in which we currently think about professionalism. So, uh, uh, WCA is obviously a very important um, board in, in, the, in the history of women's cricket. It ends up being the one that runs the first World Cup, not with their money, of course, but with someone else's money. Um, but, but essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, women's cricket, especially in England, um, and I think it's a bit like this even outside of England in, into the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But especially in, in England, women's cricket was very much played by women of, of a higher class who had the social ability um, to, you know, uh, to say that they were going to play cricket and not be told to you know, go back to the kitchen or you know, go and get a job or wh- whatever that may be. They could afford to travel because a lot of those tours were self-funded um, and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. So it would you, and I, I've never said this to you before, but would you say that women's cricket was more elitist than men's cricket um, in, that, in that period from up until almost the 90s, I suppose? 
Yeah, I think so. Um, one of the things that I say in my book, Ladies and Lords, um, plug for that, by the way. <laughs> Which you can buy in all, in all online bookstores yeah. that still sell it. Um, one of the points I make is that actually when amateurism was abolished in English men's cricket in 1962, a lot of writers then went, oh, we miss amateurism. We really love amateurism. I know we'll kind of transfer the, that, those feelings and that value onto women's cricket. So they write lovely pieces about how wonderful amateurism is in women's cricket. And, you know, when England women win the World Cup at Lords at, at home in 1993, you know, there are some lovely pieces written by cricket writers saying, oh, well, these are a wonderful bunch of girls because, um, you know, they're all lovely and charming and amateur. Um, and actually it's really unhelpful <laughs> because it it makes it kind of associates women's cricket in that sort of category of we don't really need to take it seriously um but yeah i would say it is more elitist in the sense of um there being less opportunities to break through into it if you yeah. don't have any income coming in and and that i think it's probably stronger in england because the amateur stuff well actually new zealand is another country that was very strong on the whole amateur thing you know they don't pay their men's cricketers at all <laughs> really until the until the early 2000s in in domestic cricket so that was a very amateur cricket culture but even in australia you know you go back through the stories and there was no money to be made in it and it was usually women who were either quite successful and had flexible jobs or you know came from you know a family where they didn't have to particularly work or you know, they had a husband or, you know, whatever that may be. There was a lot of that even within Australian cricket. And that's not really, you know, even not really how the men's team were by the, you know, the 90s and early 2000s. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly that part of it. The, the other thing I find really interesting, and I don't know if anyone's ever written a book about this. I know there's been a couple of really good books about the Indian and the Pakistani women's cricket teams recently. Don't think there's one on Sri Lankan women um, off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But there, I think there does need to be a study into what the... You know, the old fashioned way of, of um, Asian cricket was to get um, a man who could play cricket a job in your company. And then, you know, the, the, you, we always talk about Rangana Harath, um, you know, being a bank clerk. And he was, but he's a bank clerk that for about five months of the year was not in the bank, right? Yeah. And that was completely acceptable. That was part of his job. That was why he was there, you know, and, and the bank didn't know if he was going to go on to be a great cricketer or, or an ordinary cricketer. You know, India Cements. You know that the fame, one of the most famous companies in cricket, did a you know a really similar thing. I think Dhoni and Raul Dravid are both vice presidents of um, Indian Cement. At, you know, certainly were had very lofty titles there at certain times, and it goes right across. You know, and Pakistan, the the first class teams are obviously again, and this happened in India as well. But they've just gone back in in Pakistan to having railway teams and and all these sorts of different things. That does flow over to the women, and you know you know Shikha Pandey is. Do, do, between us, did we work out what her... Is she like a flight lieutenant or flight something? Flight lieutenant in the RAF, yeah. Yeah, and then um, a lot of the Sri Lankan women... I think the Sri Lankan women around... You might remember the year, but it was around 2010 or 2011. They got split up into three different parts of of the armed forces. So some went to the Air Force, um, some went to the Navy, and some went to the um, soldiers' infantry or whatever you call that, the other, the other one. You, I'm pretty much a, an expert on, on this sort of stuff now. <laughs> But the point is that that was that's actually a really important thing. Again, it's not quite full level professionalism, right? But it does mean that they they were getting paid, they could train. There was an understanding from their bosses at times that you know that they would be putting a lot of their time into cricket. They would have to disappear for game. It's interesting that that doesn't get as and I know maybe by that stage it was such an old fashioned way of doing things that it didn't get a thing. But that actually did help. I would have thought, you know, especially India and Sri Lankan cricket, to have some of those women have positions where they at least only had to work half the year and they could treat themselves as semi-professionals. It's not quite the same as being a professional athlete, but there's something in that, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we've just seen, this is, this is relevant, we've just seen the Sri Lankan women's team beat the England women's team at Chelmsford. Um, the last time Sri Lanka beat England was the 2013 World Cup. 50 over World Cup in India and that was um, just after the point at which they would got these sort of um, semi-professional contracts from the armed forces and it was seen to be a really important factor in how well they did in that tournament um, 
And yeah, in India, the railways has always been a kind of force to be reckoned with in women's cricket. I think Mitali Raj was was railways. I think that was one of the ways in which she developed her career. Um, and it happened in England as well, actually. So for a few years before they introduced full professional contracts, Chance to Shine, the, the charity that oh, works in state schools, had that, these yeah. um, coaching contracts. So yes. um, the ECB said, OK, they, they, they partnered up with Chance to Shine. And they said, OK, we've got these England women cricketers who can go into schools and do coaching sessions. So if you um, have con- like contract them to do that, then they'll do that 50% of the time and 50% of the time they'll be training and playing cricket for England. And so that was the kind of compromise for a while. I think that lasted for about five years between kind of a little bit of professionalism coming in and then proper full professionalism coming in. No, I remember that because I remember for a period of time, almost every time you contacted someone at Chance to Shine, like chances are it was like either a former women's player or a fringe women's player because it, what it meant was that they started hiring other people from within the women's game as well. Um, I think, you know, Rosalie Birch and, and, you know, there was, did Ebony do that as well? Yeah, I know she Ebony did. was around. Yeah. 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 So there was, you know, some p- pretty decent players, um, you know, that, that were involved in that. And then, of course, so the women professionalism in England starts in 2014. The big boom really is the women's big bash and what they did professionally. Um, how many women were, and I say professionalized because it's not quite professionalized as you actually, <laughs> you had some women who were playing professional um, Australian rules football, professional cricket, and also holding a day job. So it wasn't like quite having a normal job. But how many women were actually being paid to play cricket in Australia? Was it, was it something like 80? Am I remembering the numbers right? Or is it more than that? What, at the point at which the WBBL well, came along? When they first started, that first um, initial rank. Because I don't think everyone was fully paid, no, were they? It's, a really, it's actually a really tough question because you could probably turn around <laughs> and say that not all domestic cricketers in Australia, even now, are professional because some of them are holding down other yeah. jobs. So like Georgia Redmayne is going off and, and you know working in the hospital as a doctor and that, and that kind of thing. Um, so it... it it's very I, I, the you lines just around it. that a little bit, by the way. <laughs> can, can, I, can I say that m- the vast majority of women's cricketers in Australia are not going off and being doctors? No. <laughs> it, it, I know of two, and I've, I always say this. It's funny that there's like there's two fairly famous um, cricketers who um, they work in auto parts companies, um, and you know they, you go in and you try and buy your muffler. See, I know the lingo, Raf. Um, <laughs> And, um, and you know they go and get you the muffler and they, they sell it to you. So there, certainly that, but there is a. At the same time, there is a vast majority of women who are getting paid to play cricket in Australia that hasn't happened in other places. And it is given, we talk about that as the boom of Australian women's cricket. It's, it's the thing that sort of gave them that big shot in the arm to become the, you know, the Harlem Globetrotters of cricket. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think that it trickles in slowly over a number of years rather than um, suddenly arriving with the launch of WBBL. And there's also a big kind of sort of head-to-head battle going on between the ECB and Cricket Australia because the year before the ECB introduced its professional contracts, Cricket Australia introduced a massive pay rise and arguably that was kind of the same um, like levels of pay that the ECB then introduced. But the ECB said, well, our cricketers are professional, whereas Cricket Australia said, no, ours aren't quite professional and were maybe a little bit more honest about it. The ECB yeah. were like, no, they are professional. Even though if you were on the bottom tier contract, then you actually probably were still supplementing your income by doing something else. So like I say, it's very much blurred lines. I don't know if um, the same thing kind of happened in, in men's cricket in any period, but it's it's very blurry. Yeah, I suppose, you know, if, if you go back to the history of men's professional cricket, you, you have those original tours that they're meant. So the original test tours, that were made by England teams and by Australian teams are really, um, they make those tours to make money on for themselves. So they are, they are professional cricketers, but it's more like an entrepreneurial thing. So when the Australian team get together, that's more the famous one of, they all chip in um, some money so that they can get over on the boat and, and that someone organizes it and, you know, to pay the team manager and everything else. But then at the end of the tour, they split up all the money um, and go back. So, you know, you're not, they're not, pro, it's not a professional structure in the way that we yeah. would see it now, but they found a way of making money of it. But then if you look at after that, what happens is that they are paid match fees, they're not given contracts, 
You don't know if the Australian team's going to pick you until you're largely amateur for the next 70 or 80 years, unless you go to England to play cricket, and then you, you might play in a league or in, um, and eventually in county cricket as a professional. Um, English cricket has the, they have the, the, count, the, the county um, system, which I believe I'd have to go back through, but I don't think that was contract. That was, you, you, you got paid to play, you played so many games a year, you obviously got paid to play in, you know, you didn't just get paid to play in like the main county games. So you would play in, you know, Yorkshire might play, I don't want to say a local bank, but Yorkshire might play a minor counties or there might be another kind of game. So there was all sorts of other ways that you could make your money all the way through. But then in the off season, all those people usually had another job. And traditionally, if you weren't a major county player either, you probably had another job while you were a county player. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's the stories of, of the England bowlers, like literally walking out of the mines in the morning, going down, putting their bowling boots on bowling um, and then, you know, going back and doing an early shift in the mine the next morning. So men's cricket really doesn't become what I would say professional. We have little little professional pockets in it that people are making money, Raf, but it's not particularly going to the players. Yeah. So, you know, take that well, MCC are certainly making a lot of money. Um, they seem to still do okay. Um, you know, Cricket Australia start to make money. Some of the other smaller boards start to make little bits of money as well. But that doesn't flow on onto the players. So what that allows for is for the Rebel Tours, for Kerry Packer, for someone like Julian Khan, but even for the league cricketers. So the West Indians, you know, the famous Garfield Sobers story is that Garfield Sobers was going to play league cricket over the West Indies because he got paid more to play league cricket than he does and did in the West Indies. Mm -hmm. And even if you go back to um, Sid Barnes, Sid Barnes was in a uh, position where he, he, he got paid more to play league cricket than he was playing county cricket. And so if you have a look, he doesn't play a lot of county cricket. So it's, it's really scattered and who gets the money is, is, is a little bit dodgy all the way through. In Asia, as I said, you have this thing where you eventually you get paid to play for a company or for an organization. Um, and then, so you're not, it's not like those guys were suddenly rich or, or anything in that way, but they, they had that little bit of money. Counter cricket, you have it, but you only have it in for one half of the year. So you're not paid all that much money and you're not truly a professional. Then the big boom comes in, I would say, really the early 90s when Australia, the Australian men become uh, contracted all year round. County cricket obviously follows that. Mm -hmm. Then most of the international teams in the world over the next 10 to 15 years follow that. The money starts to trickle down to first class cricket. So the New Zealand players went on strike, Raf, in first class cricket in New Zealand in 2001. But technically it's not a strike because they'd never been paid before. Um, so they just stopped playing. <laughs> um, so that they could, So it tells you how late it was. That you could be the 15th best player in New Zealand and not make any money for your, your, your first class cricket in New Zealand at that time. So it's not as if men's cricket had money, but because of the league system in England and because there were, you know, you could play club cricket in Melbourne and, you know, get some money and club cricket in Sydney and get some money. If you were a good cricketer, there was a chance for you to make a little bit of money in, in random ways all around, um, all the way through. Whereas in women's cricket, it does feel like until the board sort of got, uh, got involved, there wasn't really a way to make any money at all, even if you were one of the best women's cricketers in the world. The only way would have been very occasionally there would have been little sponsorship deals. But I would have assumed you would have had to have been Zoe Goss or Rachel Hayho Flint to probably get any money off, in, off any kind of sponsorship. And even then, it wouldn't have been enough to make you feel like a professional. Uh, that would be fair, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. And the Women's Cricket Association, again, were really against individual sponsorship deals. Um, so they actually had this big falling out with Rachel Hayho Flint about that, who was trying to get more sponsorship um, and kind of... And, and trying to actually introduce this idea of um, giving a bit of payment back to the players and, and divvying up divvying up pots of money that she brought in via sponsorship um, amongst and th the that's players. That's quite a big deal as well yeah. because she is, she's a Tory peer. Uh, she's almost the face of what amateurism would look like. And even she's saying, we have to actually start to pay these players. We're, that's, you know, th there are certainly men who, who believe that as well, but there are lots of men who played the amateur game in English cricket were more than happy to you know that for the for the working players not not to get looked after so it's quite a big deal for your most famous cricketer and a cricketer from that privilege and background to be trying to actually professionalize the game but 
I can see why it would not have worked as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's a really interesting one politically when you think about where she ends up. Um, yeah, as you say, being a conservative peer in the House of Lords, this is actually quite a socialist system that she's trying to introduce into English women's cricket in the sort of late. 1960s early 1970s um and there isn't an awful lot of money knocking around but her her view seems to be that the money that there is should be um should be distributed actually to the players rather than the wca retaining it all in in a pot um to then kind of uh distribute as they as they see fit so it's, it's an interesting one yeah her her views are maybe a little bit internally inconsistent politically yeah yeah so we're at a stage now where, you know, the term equal pay is being talked about a lot in, in women's cricket. And we both don't think that this is anywhere near uh, equal pay. It is a PR statement as much as anything. But I think we both agree that it's a, a step in, uh, again, in the right direction. And maybe by t- the year 2030, I, I, that feels a bit optimistic, um, Raf. But, uh, you know, England cricket or maybe another cricket board will be the first one to make sure that the men and women are paid equally. That's going to happen bit by bit, right? That's not going to happen in one big thing. And, you know, the other, the other, of course, huge talking point, which we can barely fit into this podcast, would be that by the time 2030 comes around, cricketers will probably be paid a lot more to play in franchise cricket than international cricket anyway. And so uh, <laughs> the interna- international women's cricket, I don't even know how strong it will be by 2030 because franchises might completely swallow it up. But let's... Assume that doesn't happen and women's cricket continues to grow. There are more test matches or in some cases, some test matches are being played and women's cricket is thriving by 2030. In the, in the, it's probably not going to be that in, in the year 2030 that 50% of the money will go to men and 50% of the money will go to women. And that, that will take a while to get to anyway. Let's say tomorrow I gave you 25% of the total um, player pool salary to divvy out to women's cricket, right? In order for it to be equal pay, Raf, that would mean that, let, let's say, I don't know what Ben Stokes is on, but let's say he's on th- uh, three million pounds a year. Would you then give Heather Knight three million pounds a year if I gave you 25% of the total pot? Or would you be in a much better situation to make sure that the top 20 players are mm-hmm. completely comfortable and have very good lives and will be looked after, you know, even as their bodies fall apart into their older age? But you actually spread that money out far thinner at the bottom end, make sure that there are I don't know, let's say um, $5 million worth of contracts um, going out to women at 40,000 or 45,000 pounds uh, per person um, right across the game so that you get hundreds of people um, as professional cricketers. Is that not a better use of money as it trickles into women's cricket in the short term than making sure that the top women are paid the same as the top men? It probably is. I think there are arguments on both sides. Um, I think some of this is around like the symbolism and the messages that we're sending out, um, because currently the message that we're sending out to everybody is that Ben Stokes is worth, um, you know, ben, that what Ben Stokes does is more important than what Heather Knight does. And yeah. I really dislike that message. And I think it's really important we try to combat that. And that's where your equal pay comes in, because you think, well, we need to actually send out a message that what they're doing is of equal value um but the way i see it we should be paying ben stokes less and paying heather knight a bit more so they sort of meet in the middle somewhere and then yeah i do think that and and to be fair heather knight would probably agree because she's been um you know somebody who has been vocal in and saying what we need to be doing is setting up a sustainable pathway for um, you know the the England women cricketers of the future, and that involves putting more money into the the women's professional regions, and it involves putting more money into women's club cricket as well. So you've got that system coming through. Um, so yeah, probably the first thing that I'd do if you gave me that money is say, okay, we're going to make it so that each of the eight women's regions has a full um, a full cohort of domestic professional women cricketers. So I guess that would be fifteen per team. So yeah. 15 times eight, you do the maths. I can't do maths. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I'm, that's, I'm not going to do the maths. So that's what you. So that's what you. That's what you would do with the money first. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think that we want to end up in a situation where the England women's team are earning stupid amounts of money, um, whilst people underneath them are, are struggling to to pay the rent um, or to pay the electricity bill or whatever. Um, so it would be 
it would be better if we could follow a more sustainable model in women's cricket than the one that's being pursued in men's cricket. Um, unfortunately, men, uh, women's cricket is run by the same people who run men's cricket. So it will probably end up, they'll make all of the same mistakes with the women's game that they have with the men's game. So I'm afraid we're back to separate governance again, which is a, a policy dear to my heart. Anyway, that's for another podcast, Jared. No, no, no. I'll, let's, let's finish with that because I think you know that I believe in separate governance for almost everything. So I don't think that the same people who run test cricket, although technically no one runs test cricket in, in the men's game, but I don't think the people who run the test cricket should also be running T20 cricket and the people who run ODI cricket um, should also be running um, uh, test cricket and, and T20 cricket. And it is the same with the women, right? You know, there's no doubt that the ICC played a part in women's cricket getting bigger over the last, you know, eight to ten years. But there's also no doubt that uh, the ICC came in when women's cricket was already on the rise um, and was already a much more viable option because of all the work that women's cricket had done beforehand. If you separated women's cricket out completely from men's, right, if you had an, a WTA type situation, Surely there is enough money now in the ICC events, right? And franchise events um, and, and everything else. So if you had, if you had a tournament, uh, if you had a system where international cricket was run by uh, a women's version of the, uh, the w, let's go back to the WCA, right? Just to, to use that name for a moment. So WCA run all the women's cricket internationally. I know they weren't international board, but just go with me for a minute because it's easier for me to say it. If the WCA run all of women's cricket, they could also be the um, in charge of licensing all the individual tournaments. They could oversee the tournaments. They could provide the umpires. They could do what the ICC does for that. There would be a huge amount. I don't know how much women the Women's Cricket World Cup is currently worth, but it's probably worth you know 200 to 250 million dollars uh, over a five-year period at the moment. You know, especially as you'd fit a few more you might fit, women's champions league, and, <laughs> well, you know, women's league league and all these different things that you, you, you could put into that. That actually would be a situation where um, the equal pay thing, then it becomes completely separate. Right. And, uh, you know, then then it's up for the women to actually make the money themselves and to do that on their own and to look after the, themselves. The problem with the majority of all administrators in the world is they even even as cricket becomes more diverse the majority of the cricketers and cricket administrators in the world are always going to come from a male cricket background because that is where the money is and that is where the political power is right women's cricket is never going to be even if it's equal pay it's never going to be actually run the way that it should be it's very hard to argue that the ICC or the ECB or you know the BCCI or you know Cricket Sri Lanka or, you know, Cricket West Indies, any of these boards should actually be running this when the majority of the people who are in the positions of power are in there because of men's cricket anyway. Yeah. And I don't know, I, I don't know if women's golf is run on its own. Women's tennis is certainly one that, that, that is run on its own. They play to separate audiences, as we both know. It's not that there isn't a crossover. There's certainly a crossover as there is in tennis, but they do play to separate audiences. If you have an organization at the moment that had the ability to make that much money off this tournament, right, and then spread that out and hopefully have other T20 tournaments and everything else, would women's cricket in the next 10 years be in a better situation or would there be a regression because you suddenly don't have the backing of, you know, all the different boards around the world and, uh, and the money that they have already earned? Well, I think it would be in a better situation because I think it's about autonomy and independence and being and and having control over your own um your own sport basically because i do think that women's cricket and men's cricket are they're the same sport but they're also very different um so yeah the the you know we we've all been in crappy jobs that are well paid um but you feel you don't want to go to work because somebody else is controlling your life and you hate it wouldn't we all rather be doing something that we love um, obviously, like the the money matters, but maybe um, a bit less money, but a bit more autonomy and a bit more ability to feel that we have control over our lives. And I think that 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 kind of that example of our ind you know feelings that we might have had in individual situations is is women's cricket, um, you know, a microcosm of what is happening with women's cricket across the world. Is decisions are being made by a load of blokes who 
um, don't really care about women's cricket, certainly don't prioritise it. It's never at the top of their agenda. If we had separate governance, it would be the thing that the organisation would exist for. And that would be really crucial. Yeah, I, I think what it'd be interesting. The other I'm going to give you another option, which is privatisation. So you would have to buy the World Cup off the ICC, right? Or license it off them or whatever, whatever system that we do. Because you need that World Cup money, right, in order for, for this plan to work. But why would we that, have to buy it off it them? From. Did they buy it off the WCA? Because the WCA came up with Cricket World Cup. Did, they, did the ICC ever pay yeah. women's cricket any money to li- for licensing the thing that they we wouldn't have, developed? I, yeah, I... I don't think they would have. I don't think they would have paid them, but I think it would have been part of the the package when they came across. Would be that the ICC would own the rights to work. So you so you know about the uh, the disability World Cup that was played in England in 2019 that they couldn't call it a disability World Cup because mm-hmm. if you use the phrase cricket World Cup, the ICC own that, and I think they would only be able to do that if they had those rights. Uh, the the other argument is if you completely privatized it, you might just call it a World Series or, you know, a, a, a world event or, you know, you could come up with a, another name for it. But the point is, I think one way or another, you, you would want to, you want some of the access to what the ICC has done over the last 10 years, you know, uh, the, the stuff they've done. But if it is completely privatized and you had, uh, you know, I don't think you need that much money to actually buy all of women's cricket to get all the best players involved. Um, and it would be a really good investment because whatever women's cricket is now, if we look at what it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago, if there was someone who actually came in and just bought it and said, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to do what Fairbreak did times 10,000, right? Um, and I'm going to completely professionalize the women's game. Every decision we make is going to be with the women, at, you know, so there's that thing from that they talk about in Fairbreak of having shorter tournaments because women don't like being away um, for, for as long and, and, you know, as the men do. All those sorts of things, starting to ask the women players what they want to do and how they want to structure mm-hmm. their tournaments, all these sorts of things. If you do get to that point, privatization is actually a very, uh, a, a very decent um, option. And it wouldn't cost all that much. I'm not saying that you have the money, Raf, but uh, it actually wouldn't cost all that much to be able to do that. There might be someone in the future who just works that out. Because at the moment, we know that it's so sporadic and s- spread out. And as you said, at best, it's the second thing on the agenda. And usually it's the fourth or fifth thing on any agenda, right? Whereas, you know, an entrepreneur could come through and go, well, what's women's sport going to be like in, in 20 years' time? If I can break even in the first 10 or 15 years, in 20 years' time, I'm going to have owned the biggest thing. And the other way of doing it, of course, is to go back to what you were just saying, is with the star players they can be offered um, bigger salaries um, with, through privatization, but you can also offer them, you know, a percentage of um, the business and, you know, an equity in it in to, to build it correctly. Yeah, I think I, that I is the way it. of doing it. I don't think having a, a little, I don't think having another cricket board just for women is going to work. Okay. I think it has to be backed by a big chunk of money. I feel a tiny bit nervous about that. Cause what if we end up with like Elon Musk you running should. women's cricket? I, I'm, I'm, you definitely then would. It, it is Elon Musk. He's already called me. <laughs> ultimately, it's it's a man in charge. Then are there any are there any like really rich women entrepreneurs who might want to come along and put some money in? No. Well, I mean, I, I see. I think I think if you, I don't think you need to be. I, I think you you need to be a low end billionaire, right? Okay. I don't know how many <laughs> women low end billionaires that they are. But, but I think you, your major thing is really understanding how to um, get the streaming out there. That's where you're going to make your money back mm-hmm. off this particular... These I've got an idea. It will be we a combination can... of that and advertising. I've got an idea. We could get Taylor Swift to buy women's cricket. She's but got money. That? <laughs> and she's certainly not someone who occasionally um, uh, you know, makes uh, decisions based on emotion uh, or, or, or that, so that she might regret later on, uh, unlike Elon Musk. But no... Look, I, I think it's, I, I do think that there is something to that. I just don't think, in, I, I love your idea of having it as an independent organization. The problem with that is, if it's an independent organization starting with no capital, um, does women's cricket actually regress at the start just because it takes a while to get back up? I do think that the way the cricket is going is towards private ownership. And you're right, of course. But there are, you know, you know the Ambani family, 
um, is is someone who could set this up in you know th- from the money that they have in the back of one of their sofas uh, they could they could set this up there's a lot of very wealthy people around the world who could do this and the one thing I would add to this Raf is that women's cricket has often been backed by very wealthy people this isn't as it, 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 it's not as an alien a thing as maybe it might sound to other people. We know the first Women's World Cup w- was done in that way. We have seen, you know, the Pakistan women's team at time, you know, uh, uh, you know, has certainly had wealthy benefactors. We've seen a lot of different women's cricket around the world have benefactors mm-hmm. before. The difference is now that there is a chance of actually making that money back, right? You're not just putting it out. Like, I think, I think it was in your article I read recently that when they had the Women's World Cup in 1973, they basically couldn't af- afford any cricket after that, right? They, they spent so much of their money at that point that they, they, so they had a World Cup and everyone, and it, it got press, you know, there and people talked about it and the trophy was there and everyone was really excited and then they couldn't afford to have any cricket afterwards. And that's the difference between having a solid business plan and actually investing the money correctly and just having someone give you money for an event. And I think that, I think there's something in that. How you prize women cr- women's cricket away from the ICC at this stage would be a really, really interesting one. And of course, the other thing that you would have to uh, work out is how to get women's cricket into the Olympics. Um, uh, at the, you know, uh, because you, yeah. I don't think women's cricket can survive um, without extra teams coming in. I think you need you know Brazil and Japan and USA and China and those sorts of teams to you know start to play to a decent level as well. Uh, just because it doesn't have, it's it's not going to have the the depth of of men's cricket um, when it starts. But it, all these things are possible, right? Yeah. If anyone's interested in uh, starting a revolution, <laughs> then let's talk. Email Raf directly. <laughs> I, the, the thing is that I I think I know you well enough, Raf, to be like, if a billionaire did contact you, you would fear you would instantly distrust everything about them. <laughs> um, and 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 undermine your own genius uh, by by not being happy with what they do, which would be I would actually I now wish that this happens to watch the mental anguish that you would have to go through uh, to to try and be on board with this, but at the same time be like, should we really be getting them to wear skirts again? Are we sure we are we sure we want to go back to the skirts? Uh, you know, uh, do we need a calendar? I don't think we need a calendar of the women's players, uh, but. Uh, Look, I think it is fascinating, but the whole thing with women's cricket and, and, and professionalism, you, when, when did you start writing about cricket? Around 2014, 15? Was it around then? A little bit before then. Uh, I started my PhD in 2010 and I was starting blogging about 2012. 2012. Even for all the negatives and, 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 and us talking about that, I think if in 2010, if you were to have sent a, uh, a, um, a text message back then, wouldn't it? It wouldn't have been WhatsApp. Uh, you know, uh, if you'd have sent yourself a text message at that stage, say into the future, saying in 2024, the women and the men will be paid the same amount to play a game of cricket for England, not the same salary overall. What do you think, you, you know, well, actually, you'd have to send it back from 24 to 2010, wouldn't you? Wouldn't be sending it in the future. But if you were talking to your 2010 self, I still think you would have to say that this is a massive, you would have thought at that time that that would have been almost impossible and that it would have felt like a massive step forward, even if you would still have been a very... Oh, you would have been younger then. You might have been slightly less cynical. I don't know. <laughs> but it's still, a, it's still a huge step towards um, something that you've probably hoped for the majority of your life. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in, in the ECB only introduced the concept of match fees for the England women's cricket team in 2011. So we've, we've travelled a long way. But obviously, I say this all the time, the balancing act between what I do with my life is to congr- be um, you know, grateful or pleased for the progress that has been made whilst also going, no, I'm sorry, we're not going quickly enough. Can we speed up, please? Yeah. That would, it, it's funny because you do that in the win- women's game and I think that at a certain point I do a similar thing in the men's game, which is, uh, yeah, especially when it comes to the governance uh, of, of the game and occasionally something good will happen and people will be like, look, this thing has happened. And I, I'm like, yeah. But it could have happened 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, and, and, and it's happened, but it's actually, it's probably more of a ceremonial thing and actually won't make a big difference. And, and, I, and I feel that, you know, you and I are sort of trapped in this, in this thing of it is better than when both of us started and things are moving in the right direction. And we can be happy that, that certain things, I mean, we have a, 
an umpire who's a woman who is respected enough to travel around the world an umpire right like things have happened but we still don't have you know a, a, a woman head coach of, of a men's team right like we, we still don't have um uh, we still don't have the kind of you know basic structural things when you look at cricket boards in the world of having you know lots of women involved in in the actual decision making and, yeah. and all those sorts of very basic things but you know as a historian of the game who you know knows what used to happen it's still a lot less shit than it used to be but it's still a little shit <laughs> and that's the new tagline for the england and wales cricket board <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming on the podcast thanks jared